Good morning friends. Welcome to Sharad Chandra IAS Academy Daily Current Affairs Analysis for the day of 22nd April 2022. Okay. Today we are going to discuss about the following topics. Details of veto power of United Nations Security Council's permanent members. Second topic of the day is International Day for Monuments and Sites. Third topic is details of Aurora. Fourth is about the World Hemophilia Day. Fifth is the details of Solomon Islands. Let us start the t- first topic of the day that is the, detail, the details of veto power of United Nations Security Council permanent members. If you see the context, this country Liechtenstein uh, is calling the United Nations General Assembly to discuss the resolution backed by the USA which is compelling the five permanent members of United Nations Security Council to justify their usage of veto. That means there are several uh, debates going on against the veto power of the these uh, five permanent members. So they are nothing but US, uh, UK, Russia, China and France. So these five are the five, uh, these five countries are the five permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. United Nations Security Council is a 15 member body. It is a 15 member body in which 5 are permanent and 10 will be like rotating means these 10 members will uh, rotating means other countries will come time and again but these 5 members that is USA, USSR, uh, USA, UK, Russia, China and France they remain always that's the reason why they are permanent members not only being the permanent members they also enjoy the veto power okay they enjoy the veto power so veto power by using the veto power any one country any one out of these five countries can stop any resolution in the united nations security council so that is the ultimate power enjoyed by these five permanent uh, members so there are several voices in the in the world against the veto power enjoyed by only five countries so and what's the logic behind that and what's the reason behind that so that's why Liechtenstein is again questioning means uh, want the United Gen- Nations General Assembly to uh, justify their uh, use of veto so if you see the background uh, there are yeah so there is a long desire means uh, long desire is there that these permanent members will use the veto power very l- less frequently rather than using it time and again they have to use it very frequently only for the common good okay not just frequently for their political gains or for their national interest instead they have to use the veto power only for the common good of the total globe so if you see the recent uh, developments of uh, russian uh, ukraine war and uh, this again the veto power has been came forward and you know how russia is being uh, vetoing so many resolutions uh, in case of this Ukraine and Russian conflicts okay so now if you see the several countries are demanding the UNSC reforms yes that means there are more reforms are required so there are two types of reforms first of all the veto power has to be curtailed has to be limited okay limited uh, the power to veto must be limited it must be a rarest of the rare thing but not a frequent thing and second as far as possible they want to increase the number of countries okay in uh, increase the number of countries in the permanent membership that means giving this veto power and giving the permanent membership to some more countries as well which are eligible so some more countries which are eligible will get the veto power will get the uh, UNSC permanent membership and at the same time veto power must be limited that means it has to be used very rarely so such reforms are expected such reforms are expected by several countries they are being demanded by several countries so claiming that this body is a very limited representation only 15 countries are represented that too only 5 countries have the uh, veto power but it has uh, responsibility of almost safeguarding the total global peace and security that means keeping these that a big responsibility in few hands is not correct so that was the that was the uh, that's why they are demanding the unsc reforms okay right keeping a great responsibility that is safeguarding global peace and sec- security is a great responsibility but we are keeping this great responsibility in very fewer hands so that is why there is uh, 
immediate requirement in case of UNSC reforms. So, uh, the veto power is frequently mentioned in case of reforms, right? So, for example, India is also stressing repeatedly uh, about this veto power. What does it mean to have the veto power? So, if you have the veto power, if a country has the veto power, then it can block, yeah, it can block the United Nations Security Council resolution. Any United Nations Security draft or resolution can be blocked by any one of these five countries. Okay, so this veto authority is mentioned in Article 27 of the United Nations Charter. Now the blocking power, the blocking power is given to only five states. So any one of these states, if they want to block, they can block any substantive resolution of the United Nations Security Council. So when does this come into play and how does this work? Yeah. So each member of United Nations Security Council has one vote. As I said, there are 15 members. So 15 members will have one vote. Voting is different from vetoing. So 15 members will all, each of the 15 members will have one vote. Therefore, it will uh, give us 15 votes. Okay, total is 15 votes. 15 votes are there and then but only five permanent members will have veto power so voting is different from vetoing voting is just agreeing for any resolution whereas vetoing is stopping the resolution so majority yeah so you UNSC must make procedural decision with majority of vote of nine members so if any procedure if any decision has to be taken so at least nine members must agree then they out so nine out of 15 members must agree then the procedure will continue okay it will move forward so but but at the same time the condition is at least nine members must agree but okay and not even one member of this permanent member must be must disagree that means if if any one of these permanent members disagrees then the resolution will be blocked this means that any permanent member who votes against the drafted resolution prevents it being enacted okay so all the nine members affirmative vote will have and at the same time permanent members must have the conquering vote supporting votes if permanent any one of permanent member votes against that means uses it veto power then the resolution will not be enacted okay so that's the reason why uh, the power of veto is very important so what is the what are the arguments against the veto power it is very simple the first very argument is only few countries are enjoying monopoly over this uh, veto power first thing and at the same time a large amount of responsibility has been kept in fewer hands so supporters of uh, we'll see the uh, argument on both sides so there are supporters of veto power particularly the uh, countries which enjoy the veto power obviously support the veto power so supporters of the veto power argue that it will protect it will it protects against the military operations snap military operations while also promoting the international stability okay so some video so if suppose uh, this is saying that the military international stability so some disturbing resolutions may be there to which disturbs the international stability so those disturbing resolutions can be stopped by veto power so that was their argument but however that the veto in the UN's most undemocratic character. Yes, veto is the UN's most undemocratic character. So, because it effectively prevents the UN from taking against any action against the permanent members. For example, today if you see, Russia is doing a war against Ukraine. And if suppose, I mean, obviously, United Nations is there to protect the peace in the world. Peace and human development. So, it is the responsibility of the United Nations to stop the war or to act some against the Russia. But Russia being the permanent member of the United Nations, UN cannot act against the permanent member and their supporters. So, that is the reason why UN could not pass, could not continue any resolutions, could not draft any uh, resolutions which are being vetoed by the Russia okay so but at the same time another argument is these five countries which enjoy the veto are using this veto power for their self-interest 
for their geopolitical interest instead of protecting the goal of total civilians so they are preferring their own self interest and geopolitical interest over the goals goals of protecting the higher goals of protecting the total world right so what is then india stand india okay for many for many years india is hoping to be one of the permanent member of united nations it wanted a permanent seat in united nations and also the veto power so india is why because india is a member of united nations since its inception in 1945 and above all india is supplying almost double the number of peacekeepers than all the p5 nations put together that means if all these five permanent members that is us uss us uk russia china and france all these five countries okay are sending un peacekeepers but india alone is sending the double the number of peacekeepers you know what is peacekeepers united nations united nations peacekeeping force is nothing but uh, armed groups only they are they will protect the refugee camps they will protect the civilian uh, areas in the war zones okay they want to keep the peace as far as possible they want to avoid the wars so they will protect the civilians so throughout the world india is supplying the number of peacekeepers and at the same time india is a very largest democracy and a very populous country and we are also a nuclear weapon state because one of the condition for okay it is it is considered that one of the condition for being the united nations permanent member is having a strong nuclear power having a strong defense system okay so so it is naturally india is eligible india is completely eligible to be the permanent member of the uh, united uh, nations security council and at the same time india is a undisputed leader of third world countries we all know uh, that india uh, organized a movement called as non alignment movement so india was india was pioneer in organizing the movement of non alignment movement and also g77 grouping and not only this recently again we have going for solar alliance so such are the initiations made by the india so playing big, big brother role in its neighborhood and also a playing role of global leadership so that is the reason so keeping all this in mind india is completely eligible to be the member of permanent member of the united nations security council if you see if you see uh, there are so many global issues like uh, uh, internet is there uh, internet space uh, and uh, high sea high sea means uh, the waters beyond the exclusive economic zone so beyond uh, beyond the exclusive economic zone there are international waters so those are regarded as high seas and not only this there are problems there are global problems like terrorism terrorism is a global problem climate change is a global problem and cyber security is a global problem so cyber security and uh, if you see public health public health is also global problem so if you see this such as such global problems so internet space high seas so terrorism climate change cyber security public health if you how to means india is also you know at the same time india is also sufferer of uh, many of these terrorism cyber security climate change and all so there must be a collective opinion there must be a collective opinion and collective decision in order to tackle such problems in the world because they are the global problems so that's the reason why as far as possible the united nations security council must get uh, get reform okay reforms must be introduced and uh, necessary drafts have to be prepared to tackle the global challenges so then what are the challenges uh, what are the obstacles to india to become the united nations member so first of all even though we are a nuclear weapon country uh, we did not sign the nuclear proliferation treaty treaty or the comprehensive test ban treaty okay comprehensive test ban treaty these uh, two agreements were not signed by india and uh, that is one thing which united nation means the permanent members are saying that as, as you did not sign these two agreements Uh, you cannot be the permanent member that is one argument only and the second is china is there which is frequently china is frequently blocking the indian efforts to become the permanent member uh, some uh, in some cases us and U, uh, russia us and russia earlier agreed and uh, spoke in favor of india becoming the united nation uh, permanent council but uh, united nation security council permanent member but even uh, after joe biden and joe biden come to the power uh, 
uh, even US is being re restraining to speak in favor of India nowadays. And at the same time, human development, even though we are completely con uh, big country having good amount of GDP, but our human development index is quite lower. Uh, the rank is uh, quite high. Uh, so the performance in case of human development index of India is quite lower. So this is one obstacle and at the same time even though we are a strong defense country strong country we still depend upon the defense inputs from russia and usa or some other countries like france or israel because as we depend on the on the imports defense inputs are like imports so we depend on imports from other countries regarding our defense so we we have to be self reliant in our defense so then we can say that we are strong enough to be the member permanent member of un nation security council but however uh, as soon as possible we are we must expect the united nation security council reforms and indian place and indian membership as a permanent member okay moving to the next topic that is international day for monuments and sites so april 18th is declared as the united nation declared april 18th as the international monuments and sites day every year so in some countries it is also celebrated as world heritage day okay around the world international council on monuments and sites sites council international council is there to protect and organize the monuments and sites so they also support this day so the theme of world heritage day is the heritage and climate so these are the facts which may be used for uh, which may be asked in prelims so coming to the significance coming to the significance of what is this world heritage site and how unesco works to protect the world heritage sites how it recognizes world heritage sites so so to have all these in mind so let us start discussing first of all uh, these locations are recognized by the unesco un and unesco right and they will be provided some assistance the countries will be provided the assistance and training and also some uh, funds okay so if you see once a site once a site is there in your country okay the unesco you, you have to apply you have to apply that this place has very cultural and physical significance okay a place has a cultural and physical significance in my country so please recognize it as a unesco world heritage site okay so similarly india will apply like some places will india, india will choose some places and it will apply in the un un unesco apply to unesco and un to provide the united world heritage site status to that particular place okay so if you see uh, recently jaipur city and uh, uh, ramappa temple of telangana okay ramappa temple of telangana and dolavira Dolavira site of uh, Indus Valley Civilization, such sites were given the UNESCO World Heritage Site status. So what happens once it is recognized as a World Heritage Site? So if, if a site is recognized as a World Heritage Site, then the member country will uh, be provided with all sort of assistance, all sort of training and all sort of funds to protect that particular site. And it is recognized that that particular site is important not only for that country but for the total community based interest that means in global interest we have to protect that particular sites okay so both natural as well as man-made sites are recognized as the heritage sites so the list is maintained by the international world heritage program which is under the unesco okay now so as of now there are like 21 unesco member countries are elected by the general assembly and uh, it's, it is a yeah as i said any site within a, any state will be recognized as the unesco world heritage site so unesco the idea is if suppose that particular site has to be maintained must be protected if this is say some ex, uh, this site is there in some country it is like world heritage site status has been given so maintaining and protecting of this site is not good only for that particular country but it is a worldwide community's best interest okay right so what what are the eligibility to become a world heritage site first of all it must be a good landmark existing landmark that is identifiable and it must have a cultural and physical significance okay and it has to be geographically and rec 
historically recognizable area okay outside outstanding cultural and physical significance must be there okay so this is how the world heritage sites are recognized based on these conditions so as of now india has 40 unesco world heritage sites 40 so recently 40th one is the dolavira site in gujarat so this is uh, one of the indus valley civilization site dolavira site of gujarat one of the indus valley civilization site has been named as a world heritage site and uh, that is the 40th earlier 39th world heritage site was the ramapa temple of telangana okay in india we have uh, like uh, natural world heritage sites and man made world heritage site okay so several parks national parks are rec uh, recognized as world heritage sites and whereas kanchenjunga national park is a mixed world heritage site mixed uh, that means it has both the status of man made as well as natural world heritage sites right so kanchenjunga national park it has cultural significance as well as geographical significance right so this is all about the world heritage sites then coming to the details of aurora so the next news the next context is that a beautiful aurora glow was recently witnessed at iceland okay as the dead sunspot awoke sunspot means the dark spots which are visible on sun when we look through the microscope some dark spots are visible on the sun those are known as sunspots so a dead sunspot awoke okay so now it is no more dead as it awoke it is no more dead so this dead sunspot awoke and uh, this resulted in a, a beautiful aurora glow which was witnessed in iceland and so okay what is this aurora it is a basically a geographical entity a geographical concept aurora so aurora is nothing but a natural light show okay a multiple color light show a beautiful light show is there very beautiful to it is a fish to the eyes so they occur mostly frequently in the high latitudes mostly in arctic and antarctic so even in the middle latitudes also they occur but very frequently in equator they are almost absent okay another name of this aurora is polar light so as they are frequently occurring at the polar region they are also called as polar light so very recently they will occur in middle latitudes and at equator in equatorial zone uh, it is highly impossible to see the auroras okay there are two types of auroras that is aurora aurora borealis and aurora australis they are nothing but this is in northern hemisphere and this is in southern hemisphere if it is southern hemisphere they it is called as australis if it is in northern hemisphere it is called as borealis next Generally, where we see these uh, auroras, as I said, at higher north and southern latitudes, so at more than like 60 degrees, 70, 80 degrees and 90 degrees latitudes, 80 degrees, 70 degrees, more than 70 degrees latitude, both in northern and southern hemispheres. So they are very, very scarce near the equator, almost absent. They are less common, so frequently they will occur in frequently they will occur in higher latitudes, very, very rarely in middle latitudes, almost absent near the equator okay so the the what were the colors the colors are like milky greenish blue color okay if you see i will show the pictures like if you have okay so here here what how we see the auroras so generally we can see this, this is a beautiful almost fish to the eyes okay we must be very lucky to see such beautiful natural phenomenon okay in the sky right so they are like milky greenish mostly milky greenish sometimes red blue violet pink and white okay in variety of shapes variety of shapes in change in regular basis as you can see here they are having variety of shapes and variety of uh, different colors mostly greenish color is dominating but not only greenish some other colors red pink blue will also color okay so now, what is a why why this happen and what is the phenomenon behind this beautiful eye fish okay so if i want to explain you this the, this is a relation between sun and earth's magnetic field okay that means earth's magnetic field is related to the sun means a, a relation is going on that means our planet earth is connected to the sun electrically okay that is earth's magnetic 
field is there around the earth okay you know that the earth's magnetic field is there around the earth so when the sun rays sun rays enter the earth's magnetic field then this beautiful phenomena will occur okay what are the reasons and what is the phenomenon exactly we will see now okay so the see there were see if the fast moving electrons fast moving electrons will when they move uh, when they collide with the atmospheric particles okay with the atmospheric particles in our atmosphere collisions between the fast moving electrons and uh, oxygen and nitrogen of the earth's upper atmosphere these oxygen and nitrogen will excite okay so if you see uh, this uh, these are two types of see aurora borealis in northern hemisphere and aurora australis in southern hemisphere so two different pics so i just want to show this so yeah please observe this see when solar light enters into the earth's magnetic field so here if it is earth earth is surrounded by the magnetic field you know earth is a huge magnet it acts as a huge magnet that is why we say north pole and south pole so determining the huge magnet now this is the magnetic field around the sound uh, around the earth so this is regarded as a magnetic shield so when light enters the earth when light enters the earth here you will see the electrons the electrons will collide with the particles atmospheric particles of oxygen and nitrogen and these atmospheric particles will get excited okay you know excited means uh, means our electrons moving from lower energy orbitals to the higher energy orbitals is known as excitement okay oxygen and nitrogen atoms and molecules will excite okay the oxygen and nitrogen atom molecules in our atmosphere particularly the earth's magnetosphere earth's magnetic field so these atoms present in earth's magnetic uh, earth's magnetic field will get excited when the fast moving electrons will collide with them that means they are supplied with some energy from sun therefore they will get excited right once excited an atom will never continue in the excited position as far as as soon as possible the atom will come to the ground state okay this is the concept of the chemistry where if the energy is given to the atom the electron will jump to the higher orbitals so that is known as excited state and once as soon as possible the energy will be released and the atom will reach to the ground state so here in the process of in the process of c by receiving the energy the atom will get excited by giving away the energy the atom will reach the ground state but this giving away energy is in the form of light energy that means losing energy atom will lose the energy in the form of light energy so if you see this light energy will be visible in the photons or little bursts of energy in the form of light are produced when gases return to the original condition or the ground state so such such a huge collision means th this process will repeat with more number of electrons more number of atoms and finally it appears it appears to our eye as a aurora okay if you see here now if you see here you see this so electrons will hit the air molecules this air molecules will get excited this excited will again reach to the ground state by emitting the light okay if you if this repeats for many for many atoms then we can see the aurora so generally this process happens from 100 kilometers to 400 kilometers of the atmosphere okay so so generally it is from 100 to 400 kilometers so the color of aurora is influenced by our gases of oxygen and nitrogen okay so and is driven by the electrons how excited it becomes so the color is again so there are why we see different colors because there are so oxygen and nitrogen are basic gases which receive which which get excited uh, by receiving the electrons by colliding with the electrons so it, that reasons are different as you know that each light has different frequency means the bombardment energy supplied to the atom or uh, the excited energy present in the atom will result in different types of lights based upon the frequency they may provide red light green light or violet light like that so okay so low energy electrons cause the red light high energy cause the green light 
so based upon the energy received by the bombardment of the electron with the atoms the uh, type of light is visible okay so nitrogen generally emits blue light so combining all these colors purple pink white oxygen will emit the mostly ultraviolet light which can be detected by the satellite cameras as well now is there any effect on the our human life because of this auroras yes auroras will affect the our communication system radio system and energy lines right so finally it is worth remembering that the sun's energy which is manifested as the solar winds is at the center of it so as i said you this energy solar winds these are light rays which are called as solar winds so these are uh, solar winds so once uh, this energy is manifested so the process behind this aurora is like this so the energy sun energy will be given to this process uh, will be given to the atmospheric particles they will get excited after reaching the excitement position they will again come to the ground state by emitting some light of different colors that colors we will see as the aurora okay the fourth news is about the hemophilia okay hemophilia disorder so if you see this now uh, April 17th is uh, April 17th is commemorated as the World Hemophilia Day to create the awareness among the public about the danger caused by this hemophilia. So, World Federation of Hemophilia honors the Frank Schnabel, the organization founder of this. Means uh, it is an organization. World Federation of Hemophilia is an organization, and its founder is Frank Schnabel. So, they remembered the Frank Schnabel in the uh, on April 17th. So this year the theme is access for all partnership policy and progress 2022. So it is getting active support from the governments and incorporating these bleeding diseases into their national policy. For example if Indian national health policy is there then India must take enough uh, care to include whatever the case and whatever the uh, whatever it can do to reduce the hemophilia cases in India. So what is hemophilia and how this occurs so what is the danger about this we'll see. Hemophilia is basically a blood clotting disorder okay that causes severe bleeding even in the minor traumas okay if you see this this is basically caused by the mutation in genes okay mutation mutation means a change mutation in genetic in genes at genetic level will cause the will cause that there will be order has to be given to some protein some coagulation so generally coagulating proteins will play the leading role in coagulating or in clotting of the blood so this provide the instructions these genes will generally the genes with the genes has to provide instruction for making clotting factor proteins needed to form the blood clot okay if suppose if they get mutated that means they get changed they fail to instruct they fail to instruct for the clotting so it generally so this as this is a genetic modification this will tran get transferred to the children as well so it will become a hereditary problem hereditary problem to the children it may get, it might get or might not get but uh, the problem exists so some coagulation factors some coagulation factors will help for clotting actually coagulation factors will help for clotting but here what is happening the genes are unable to give instruction for the coagulation factors to act upon so that's the reason why clotting will not occur and hence there will be severe bleeding okay so there are uh, if you see if you see a normal blood vessel so these are normal blood vessels some hemorrhage some damage has been done to the blood vessel so then the bleeding started normal if support is healthy then what happens the genes will uh, instruct instruct the particular protein coagulant factor to clot the blood vessel and hence the uh, bleeding will stop whereas in case of hemophilia in case of hemophilia the instruction will fail the instruction will not come because the, the, gene, the genes has been modified there is mutation in gene gene is failing to instruct so that's the reason why the coagulation proteins will not act and the clotting will not be done and there is lot of 
bleeding okay that's, there is no stop in the bleeding so that is a uh, case of hemophilia okay uh, if uh, india is considered there are more than 136000 hemophilia cases have been diagnosed in india okay so that's why we must also be very careful regarding this so indian health policy shall also concentrate on hemophilia as a disease okay. and the fifth concept for day is the details of solomon island yeah so this particular topic has been already discussed on the 16th april so okay this particular topic was already discussed detailedly on the 16th april 2022 and the video has been posted in, on our site so please refer for the complete details but however here we can say that there it was only a, a rumors uh, there it was said that the, some information has been leaked that china is going to sign uh, uh, agreement with the solomon but here china itself announced china itself announced openly that is agreement uh, security agreement is going uh, is getting in practice with the solomon islands right so as i said it is the very first of its kind solomon island is the island located near australia I mean uh, if it is this is australia this is papua new guinea here you find solomon islands part of australia and oceania continent so it is a island country it is a archipelago country the capital of solomon is on oniara now the problem here is it is a, as china wanted to involve in the so once it you know the chi- aggression of china in south uh, south china sea so they now china wanted to enter even in the south pacific region south pacific region by disturbing the uh, relation by disturbing uh, the area like uh, if it is uh, located here and if it is uh, for example imagine the the sec- because of the security agreement if china establishes a naval base establishes an oil base near australia then it would be quite difficult for both us and australia uh, in case any aggression is happened or uh, in case uh, even japan is there so it the, the solomon islands is very strategically located between japan us and uh, australia on other side so that's why china is more concentrating on uh, going for a deal with solomon islands so it will threat to the it will it may destabilize the relations in the south pacific region so balance of power may occur in the south uh, south pacific region so this particular topic has been very ex- uh, detailedly discussed in 16th april 2022 video please refer to that video okay uh, this is all for today thank you